I mean, I think we should introduce ourselves. We should, I suppose. So, uh, Jos, you're a wonderful man. Tell us all about you. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Jos Potfleet. I'm currently uh, working as uh, head of marketing at Nextcloud, where I'm also co-founder. And been around the open source for more than a decade. I mean, I, I know some of you uh, and the others I hope to get to know. And well, I'm definitely interested, obviously, in open source business simply because we're running one, and it is definitely a wild ride. I mean, a lot of you probably know Nextcloud. It's been a pretty crazy two years. And for me personally, I also hope that this conversation will help get me some interesting ideas, uh, and otherwise, well, I hope I can share mine with others. Sam. Uh, I'm Sam. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I run an open source business called PHP List. We are a software as a service, open source email marketing platform, a bit like MailChimp. In the past, I've worked for uh, Collabra, specifically with their LibreOffice Online and uh, LibreOffice related products. Uh, I worked also five years for the Free Software Foundation Europe. So I've moved from non profit to for profit to, yeah where I am now through campaigning to marketing to more strategic side. And uh, certainly Jos and I have and continue to experience plenty of challenges, strategically speaking and marketing-wise, with uh, respective open source products uh, on a regular basis. Um, we had a, a, a great overview of challenges faced by Elastic in the last session. I'm looking forward to hearing the challenges that you guys have faced and hopefully some solutions that you found work really well for you. Um, so that's me, and this uh, format is designed to be as participatory as possible. We can thank the uh, Fosback stage guys for actually suggesting to us to use this in the first place. Yes. Uh, it's a first for us. Uh, I know it's a first for, for many of you, but we call this the, uh, the fishbowl, circular almost. Um, and uh, we will have uh, effectively a panel discussion where any of you can uh, enter or exit uh, as you wish, uh, depending on what you want to contribute when something comes up that you have some burning content to, to add. We will keep one chair uh, free out of the six at all times, and that means that uh, any of you can occupy that empty seat as you wish, so you just need to get up, walk over and sit down. Uh, there will be too many eyes on the discussion, so don't worry about that, and probably they'll be looking at the back of your head in any case. Um, that includes questions, by the way, so any time you have something to contribute at all to the discussion, you just need to get up, uh, take a seat, and either wait for a natural break or, or, or fight for an opportunity to, to make your point. Jos uh, uh, and I will be moderating during this. We'll be in different roles, and we'll be uh, switching our roles at different times. Um, I think it'll be fairly obvious, hopefully, what, what we're doing, but uh, your focus will be the debate rather than what's going on with us. And um, yeah, we will rotate uh, between themes. So we have some uh, hopefully interesting questions for you that will provide some stimulus uh, for this uh, debate to, to flow around. And uh, at a couple of points uh, during this panel discussion, uh, a new theme will be introduced. And at that point, we'll probably ask some or all of the members of the panel, uh, as they are at that point, to, to switch. And we reserve the right to invite people in at particular points or theoretically or kick people out leave. as well. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so the main rule of the model is that only the people on the panel speak, and the rest wait to, to have their say when they manage to join the panel. So when somebody joins, one of the other people has to leave, of course. You're free to choose. If you, I mean, if you just have a, one thing to add, I mean, you can get up, join, speak your piece, and leave again, right? It, you can leave at any time, um, and actually that's helpful because it helps other people to join. If there are two or three free chairs, please really consider joining. If all six chairs are full and you're sitting there, please consider if, you know, maybe it's time for somebody else to say something. Um, yeah, well, we'll have to see how it flows. If people join too much, too little, maybe we'll nudge people or you know, try to tell them not uh, uh, to leave. But uh, yeah, yeah. we'll see how it goes. Good, OK. So um, again, the previous talk did a great job of introducing a few different models uh, for open source businesses. Uh, We've grouped them into three categories uh, for simplicity, uh, products-based, services-based, and, and SaaS-based. So these are like the kind of offering that the company provides. And we're going to go into a bit more 
depth now, just so we have a common framework of language and understanding before we get into the, the panel. I know different people have different backgrounds, and it's helpful to be able to communicate on the same themes. So uh, product-based, uh, the product might be, uh, well, generally hardware-type products. So typically, this is when companies want to move up the, the value chain, and the software is no longer where they're making their profit, right? So uh, a classic example would be uh, IBM, who wanted to focus on their, the hardware business, uh, but they recognized that the software side was a necessary complement for them to be able to sell their hardware, their, their server hardware. Without that, they just couldn't do any business. So they shared the cost, the, the, the load, by uh, open sourcing and uh, uh, incorporating existing open source software and extending it. Uh, those are the kind of hardware products we're talking about. Also, Guitar Mod is a nice example startup based here in Berlin. They make guitar panels. Uh, they sell the hardware. The software is fully open source. It's a very nice platform. It uses LV2 plugins. Maybe some of you at the Linux Audio Conference last weekend. Maybe not. <laughs> Catch it next year. Uh, then we have uh, licensing, dual licensing. So Elastic gave us a good example of that also in the previous talk, if you were here. They use dual licensing uh, with their own custom uh, EULA agreement, as well as the uh, uh, open source licensing that, that they use for their, for the, yeah, for the, for their open source offerings. Uh, other examples of companies uh, using licensing, Nginx, Magento, recently got acquired by Adobe for roughly 1.7 billion, as you may have read. Uh, yeah, GitLab, uh, MySQL, OwnCloud, not NextCloud. Uh, selling binaries, absolutely. So that's kind of a convenience thing, right? Uh, there are plenty of open source apps which are on uh, the Google Play Store and making good money uh, revenue-wise from that. Uh, Collabora has also used this uh, in the past for some of their, their desktop products. Uh, so there's, there's the, obviously, there's a lot of work that goes into making the software behind it, but the way that that's monetized can, uh, can often be by charging for access to the binaries, the, uh, the convenient updates, the repositories, and so on. Um, Krita on Steam, exactly. Those are both examples of Android apps right at the bottom. So. The second main model of making money on open source is, of course, services. I mean, if you have a community of, of open source developers and you're building a piece of open source together and somebody comes and says, hey, I want feature X, it is not terribly hard to imagine that that person can develop it himself and look for somebody to pay to do it. And at which point you basically have the beginnings of a consulting service. Um, and, of course, if you have that expertise and you put it together in a company and you're developing software already for other people, it's a pretty small step to say, well, we can also maybe train your system administrators to deploy the software or we can give a training on how to add modules or you know, other stuff. And basically, you're simply sharing the knowledge that you have as participants in the community. Uh, the third model is a little different from the first two. Uh, it's, it's, on one hand, it's the same. You're simply using your expertise to support. If, if, if you're a big company, you're deploying a piece of software that you need to basically run your business. It's business critical, and you don't have a support contract, and the system goes down. I'm pretty sure that the sysadmin who was responsible for deploying that piece of software and then not getting a support contract is, well, probably looking for another job soon. So one way of putting the support offering is usually providing job security to the people who deploy the software. <laughs> Um, and the interesting thing and the difference between the first two and the third is that uh, the third scales in a different way. If you need to give twice as many trainings, you need to have twice as many people giving trainings. If you need to write twice as much software for customers as a consultant, you need twice as many people. Actually, we all know the reality of a company is that if you have twice as many people doing work, you get about four times as many managers as overhead and your total costs go up exponentially. So these models don't scale in a very fundamental way. If, if you're running an open source community or you're part of an open source community, and you want to build a business around it, and you want to essentially pay people to work on the software to improve the product, because in the end, your passion is to work on this open source project. Now, if that is your goal, then consulting can work, because sometimes these customers pay you for features that you perhaps would have wanted to develop at some point anyway. And essentially, by paying money, they change the priorities, which is fine, which can be good. But we also all know that, first of all, customers usually have no vision about the future. They want a little extra button. They want to disable something. They want to add stuff that you would never want in your product. Or they just want a sixth encryption algorithm. So this is not great for product development. Uh, and, and training doesn't help you at all. It might help you grow your community, but it won't really help you make your software better. But the third one could, 
because if you have twice as many customers, you don't need twice as many support people. It's more like, I don't know, 10%. Especially if, like what we do in Nextcloud, um, our main benefit of support is actually you get direct access to our engineers. So yes, our engineers spend a percentage of their time on support, but that percentage is pretty low. It usually helps them fix bugs, uh, keeps them a bit in contact with the needs of customers. So it's a win-win. It's not that costly. And the more customers we have, the more engineers we can hire, and they do work on the product. So we do improve Nextcloud by getting more customers, which would not really have been the case with the other two. So building, if you want to build a product, you essentially need a support model one way or another. Well, let's debate that in a minute, right? But well, let's get to the next right, slide. OK, okay so software as a service. Uh, oh, oops, sorry. Software as a service is uh, my business model. Uh, you're all very familiar with it. It's, it's possibly more open source, uh, new open source being created, software as a service than any other that, that, that I see anyway at the moment. Um, again, you're familiar with it, so let's move on to the next. And that's the first question. And now we're at the first question, exactly. So um, we want your views on uh, why we would choose to build our business within a, you know, on top of open source products to start with, products or services. Like, why do it? I mean, a lot of this discussion is probably going to be about the challenges, right? So, so we, we need to remember the, the, <laughs> the motivations that we started out with. Um, also in the previous session, uh, we heard how successful projects like uh, Postgres, SQL, and many others exist quite fine without having a single you know, commercial entity behind them. So, so what are the advantages? Um, some of the advantages uh, might be uh, erecting barriers to entry for other firms uh, so that uh, it's less attractive for a proprietary software firm to uh, enter a market where they know that there's already a, a good enough or even a great uh, free offering, uh, license-free offering. Uh, other advantages might be uh, access to um, decision makers, because if you're in a repository, it's super easy to apt get or yum install the software. Maybe it's a bit harder sell for a system administrator to download a proprietary binary that they don't trust so much. Um, and yeah, we know that uh, with data protection changes and also policies in particularly sensitive sectors, uh, being able to self-host or just being able to inspect the source code can be a real differentiator, maybe especially with GDPR. We're personally, we're getting a lot of more inquiries about uh, moving data to Europe, for example, at PHP List uh, because of these uh, onerous obligations from the GDPR. Um, and yeah, so why do it? So who here is uh, working for or, or running their own open source firm as it stands right right now? Would be lovely if some of you would join already, and then we can start a conversation with just going over, well, the reasons why yeah. your company is using open source. Exactly. If you raise your hand, please, uh, please take one of the five free available seats. Exactly. Yes. Um, you join. Yeah. I will make okay. notes and two microphones. So we have only two microphones, so you have to hand them around a little bit. But I think two will be sufficient. We, we still have a, a, an empty. We have two empty seats. Well, please, Michael. <laughs> uh, wouldn't you join? You're almost here. Anyway. Uh, yeah, but if I take, right, okay, that's true. So that's the only one. I think we're good. <sighs> so guys, why? Why did you start out? <laughs> well, I was already involved in Hadoop and had been for quite a few years, and. Actually, let me run through the story of how Hortonworks got founded. Um, basically, our CEO, Rob Bearden, was working at Benchmark Capital, and he was looking to invest in a Hadoop company. And so he started looking around, talked to some of our competitors, saw that they weren't driving the tech as much as the group of us over at Yahoo. And he wanted, he'd done open source companies before and wanted to get the people who were actually driving the majority of the tech forward. And so he actually started through a negotiation between us, uh, Yahoo management, and Benchmark. And so there was an existing open source application, Hadoop, which right. had value and had been proven. And, and had community. <laughs> community, exactly. And some of the consumers of that product effectively were unhappy with the speed of, of development. They wanted to accelerate it. Actually, mostly they wanted commercial support, okay. um, but they also wanted to accelerate the, the direction. So it was to provide, uh, to, to cater to their own needs, effectively, to their, exactly. their own commercial so, support needs. So exactly. Uh, companies wanted someone to call in the middle of the night if their 
Hadoop cluster went down because Hadoop, of course, ends up in people's production pipelines, and that's actually critical to this whole thing, is your application has to be critical to their business because they have to see a negative value if their system goes down or they're not going to pay for support. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's actually not much I can add to it. It's, it's really um, open source is a type of way higher release things, right? I mean, it's, it's not about, um, it's, it's not from a business perspective, it's not about doing the right thing, but it's more in providing people actually with a missing gap. And that's what um, what we also do. I mean, um, Copano. So, so you identified at yeah. Copano that your customers are missing something, that, that there's uh, something that's not being delivered, something that's not being catered to. Exactly. And somehow by being open source at Copano, your product does something that your competition does not. Exactly. What, what is the gap then being, being well, filled? Well, the gap is, is this, um, specifically for us, we are the only open source MAPI backend that exists in the world. So um, MAPI in itself, from looking uh, top to bottom, is quite easy, but it can get very complex. And uh, we're talking about a standard that exists now for 30 years, a Microsoft standard, which is yeah, sort of a standard. Microsoft but standard for email exchange. It, well, it's, it's not just email. It's task notes, uh, whatever. I mean, everything that, that comes from the messaging world. If you imagine Microsoft Outlook, uh, that's, that's the primary MAPI client in the world. And um, I mean, this, this actually comes as, as a derivation or a derivative from uh, Serafa, which was an open core company. And um, we actually had quite some nice tenders. And um, we actually decided then to say, you know what, let's double down on open. Uh, we didn't want to do open core anymore because it also had some, some downsides to it. Um, and uh, the Copano refounding also enabled us to get rid of the proprietary bits. So, um, I mean, Microsoft Outlook is still a dominating client in the world, especially in the business world. Um, but people are starting to realize, well, there is other good stuff as well. And um, that's where it actually comes in. The community is also a great thing because, um, you know, you get suggestions in a much direct, much... Um, much um, fluent way, yeah. let's call it that way, so your product can improve by other people that send in patches, PRs, whatever. Um, and at the same time, you get a feeling actually for where, where you want to go. And the commercial side of it is, is actually that you get that a little bit reprioritized by the customers, obviously. Um, but it's, it's, it's one world, and so the product in total gets Those better. are some clear uh, benefits that you get as an open source, uh, running an open source uh, uh, project, company, well, yeah. however we want to describe it. But uh, it's hard to put a dollar value on those contributions, right? I mean, you can also have lead customers as a proprietary firm. Uh, were these the reasons why Zarafa, for example, if we take one step back, because you're saying that your decision within Capano to, to, to continue to be open source is, is partly an extension of the heritage of the firm by the sounds of things, right? Sort of. Um, the, the, the thing is just the following. When, when, you, when you end up with just having uh, the commercial side of it, you will end up having a product that is just tailored, for example, for enterprise business. Um, we have a lot of enterprise customers ranging in, in six-digit uh, user installations, but the problem is, is that they have different needs than a 50-user installation or a five-user installation. And our goal was to pro provide a software that works for both worlds. So it's very modular, it works on very tiny, you can run it on a Raspberry because Pi. Because it's a bigger target market, you're going to be selling to both those, those use cases? That or? is one thing. Um, and the other thing is, is, is that, the, especially in the communications market, if you have a communication solutions like we do, um, then you need something that works for teams, also in smaller areas, and also for larger ones. It's, it's a little bit a hard thing, right? Because the, the need of a, of a small customer is completely different from an enterprise customer. Okay. So with, it, with the open source community, you get kind of, for free, a very broad variety of users and, yes. and feedback and input onto to shaping the, yes. the, the product. Yes. Yeah. By for free, I meant like not on an individual yeah, yeah. basis, but obviously <laughs> there is a, a cost to supporting a community. Please, we'd like to hear from you. Okay, so my company is called Shape Blue. We work 100% in Apache Cloud Stack, which is eff effectively, I mean, I, I choose these words carefully, but we're effectively a vendor in that, in that community. We don't sell software, we sell services. And in fact, our journey is very similar to the, you know, the, the uh, slide deck you had up there in terms of we started as a 
general consultancy. I used to run a, a service provider business before then. Uh, and we were consulting, helping organizations build their, their cloud infrastructures and that sort of thing. And then we got more and more dragged into this project. And over time, we would move from consulting to training, then offering a support because service. Because of demand. Exactly, exactly. But one really interesting thing, so most of our revenue comes from support, and it's been a, a very successful business model for us. But the key bit that you didn't have on your slide is a lot of our customers effectively want us as a community proxy. to, to mm -hmm. sort of act, They don't want to get involved in the open source project. We try to get them involved, but some of these organizations just want to cut a purchase order and know that their software is going to work. Uh, an, so an interface to what specifically in the community, though? Because they probably don't want the flame wars and so on. It's, it's, it's the access, access to the engineering. Not. Access to the engineering, access to where the project is going in terms of, you know, their, you know, their business is going in this direction. They want some more support around a particular technology. So somebody can, you know, people in, the, uh, in a provider who can actually have sort of help influence the direction of the project. Yeah, yeah. And to be frank, you know, they haven't got time to do that or the inclination to do it, which makes me sad sometimes. I, you know, I really wish some of our customers would get more involved in, in the project. But that's, there's, there's challenges around that, particularly with the Apache governance model. I mean, we've got 30 people in our organization and 22 committers in the project. So we're sort of quite dominant mm. in, in the project. And I have to go to a lot of effort to make sure we don't get perceived as this vendor that's trying to do things in our own direction. Mm -hmm. And the only way of doing that is to actually have, you know, community first. Ed, you know, that's it's part enough. of your interface, the community that you've Completely. got to manage Completely. expectations both sides yeah. by the sound stage. Which, which sometimes makes, you know, the internals uh, of running a business sometimes a bit of a challenge because, yeah. you know, I have PMC members who are direct reports to me uh, at work and sometimes we have to sort of take work hat off and put PMC hat on. Yeah. Uh, but it, it, it's worked and we've just fallen into that model. Mm. There, was, there was no great strategy around it, we fell into this project. Uh, so it sounds like we've, we've got two projects represented uh, here who were taking an existing open source uh, application or ecosystem and because of strong demand for that product, because it was, it's proven its value, uh, you were responding to demand and yeah, delivering Correct. services on top. In your case, you, uh, both with Zarafa and Capano, you created new products effectively. Uh, they incorporated some other open source applications as most do, um, but you took the decision to actually incorporate something fresh. And in your case, was it an existing product or something fresh? It's not a product. So um, I've previously been involved in running serv software services companies multiple times. Um, and my background was primarily um, proprietary software, but system software, hard stuff. So claiming to be great engineers, OK? Um, when I got in involved in CodeThink, I was trying to find out what the fuck open source was about. <laughs> and I discovered that actually the people in CodeThink, it was very small at that time, were just dramatically better than the people I would typically work with. So one of the things that actually motivates me is doing great work. And to be suddenly surprised by an organization which was working for the same kind of companies I already had experience with, but their people were demonstrably better, changed my perspective. Um, it's not to say that it's an easy road, but as a, as a result of focusing on better quality engineering. But can um, you say a little bit more for people who aren't familiar with, with CoThink? So, you, so you uh, better quality engineering of what? what, what? Uh, we, we are system software engineering specialists. So that means uh, one, of the, one of the things I can now say is companies call us when their project is completely screwed. Uh, <laughs> when, when they've hired much bigger companies to do a custom Linux system and they've completely messed it up because they don't understand how upstream works, how the communities work. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really does keep happening that our customers and our competitors discover that our people look just no more. And that is, it's not achievable without the collaboration. So I, I came to realize over a few years that the, part of the difference is everybody's talking to everybody and sharing information. Getting involved in those communities. Guys, exactly, the proprietary guys are Googling and saying, oh yes, I'm a <laughs> Linux expert but they're not doing the work. They're not gaining the same level of knowledge. So it's, it's become a clear differentiator for us. Uh, I remain astonished that there are so few straight software services firms that play this card. You know, Calabra is one, Egalia is another, but in, in our space there are very few organizations competing and much bigger companies that are demonstrably worse than us. So, so you're again interfacing to these open source communities uh, and uh, adding the experts you're hiring from these communities too, presumably, in order yep. to get this, this engineering expertise. Yep. Interesting, yeah. So, please, and also somebody needs to uh, vac vacate. Oh. <laughs>
So uh, an entirely different direction. I'm not working for this company anymore, but I was working for a company um, that was going into a market that's already pretty satur saturated. And one of the strategies that the existing uh, companies in this market was using was, was uh, vendor lock-in. Um, we have your data. How are you going to get your data out of our system and into that system? Think about it. You wouldn't want anything bad to happen to your lovely data, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, one of the advantages that the company I was working for was using was they were saying, we'll help you solve this problem with getting your data out, but once you have your data out, you're going to want to think about this not happening again. Um, we promise that we'll give you your data, A, but that doesn't do you much good if you don't have the software that can operate on the data. Look, we're open source, so it actually means something that will give you your data. So do I understand then that you were providing so this? So what, what what came out of this, by the way? The, the can you name the the project or the, the product? Oh, this is this is actually um, the the company was named is named Quailap and the project is Finract. Finract. Um, so so the value that Finract adds, one of the key differentiators, the benefits that it gets from being open source, is that your customers know that vendor lock in is uh, not so much of a threat. Right. And so therefore, you depend upon those customers. Understanding that, understanding that that's valuable, and, and being prepared to pay for it. And because the market is fairly old, uh, many customers have had negative experience with vendor lock-in yeah. at this point. Yeah, we, we have exactly the same situation. I mean, when we took our support service to market, we sort of promoted it as an open source, uh, you know, being a fully open source, uh, a round of open source product. And we actually had a very large vendor in our project at the time, I won't use their name here because it's been recorded, who were trying to sell a prior, uh, proprietary distribution of, of CloudStack as well. Sorry, it's my phone ring. And uh, we were very, very successful in the space because we went to the customers and said, no, this is completely open source. We will sit on the side. And they liked that message. It did with some particularly sort of uh, traditional conservative organizations, it took some time to get that message through because yep. they had had vendors telling them how they polish everything so it shines so much, which wasn't always the case. Uh, but I think you know, the market is coming round to, to that concept of open source gives them you know, a peace of mind and a long-term organic stability to, to the software that they won't get from a vendor whose roadmap is going to flick all over. Yep. They might leave a project, and that's actually exactly what happened with, uh, with Apache CloudStack. Do we have experience with uh, targeting a market which does not understand uh, or value the differences of open source uh, beyond these technical consumers, uh, technical decision makers, uh, system mm -hmm. administrators, uh, who maybe have, have, they know this product, they, they, they know the project, they know the community, they know there's a need to, to interface. But what about maybe uh, consumers, like end, you know, end users who are not from this line? I have an awesome story to share here. Um, <laughs> we, we provide a web application that has been multiple times awarded. It's really nice. And we also have a, a desktop application which embodies this web application. Um, I also won't say the customer here, but it's someone everyone knows. And um, the, the problem that we had was they were using Outlook all over the place. Um, they were happy with it, and then they heard, okay, uh, we're not going to support Outlook in that way as we did in the past. And so they were thinking of what can we do to make the people actually accept it. This is no joke. We just replaced the icon of our thing, renamed it Outlook, and the acceptance was really there. This is on the desktop or, so, uh, or the cloud product? It's, it, they, the, 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 the reality is, is, is don't ask a user for what actually is about. For them, it was, oh, it's a new Outlook version, right? Um, <laughs> it's, it, the, the reality is um, there's, there, you, you always have to make a differentiation of what type of users you're talking to. Obviously, in, in a Hadoop world, the users, consumers, are just on a completely different technical level. Exactly. And the thing that we have is this is that, um, I mean, something like email is basic, right? Um, but we all not only do that, we do web meetings, which can get more complex. But the consumer wins by the effect that the solution is still easy. So our, our main problem is, is you have to make things so stupid, so, so really 
yeah, intuitive in a way that you don't have to teach the people. But the, the biggest challenge for us at least is, is to get people think about new things, right? So, you know, when, when people log into Google and Gmail, right? They know it's a web application. So the expectation management there is, is quite natural. When they go into their business and they're used to Microsoft Outlook, then they expect a fat client, which is like over freighted with all kinds of stuff. But they don't expect web meetings and stuff like that. So the, the fun part is, is really managing these expectations. Just rename it, rebrand it, whatever. In the so brands are extremely yeah. powerful, but there are ways around them if the product's up to par. That's yeah. the lesson we yeah. can take from this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Good. Uh, we have some other questions that we would like to put to the room. Uh, is there any final point on why start an open source business in the first place that we'd like to make before we move on? I actually wanted to make one more point, which was that, um, of course, as a dev rather than a business guy, I love working on open source. And so making a company where we get to work on open source and keep the whole product open across the stack and not open core is really awesome, right? Um, and so it we, really we perhaps helps say, attracting the talent in. Yeah. I mean, just like he was saying that um, people like working on open source, and so it, it makes it much easier to hire, actually. It can be part of the vision of a, of a product in itself, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, I think we should refresh the panel now, and I'm going to put the next question on screen. Thank you. All right, um, so because this is a reasonably common model, uh, we wanted to put up a couple of questions around um, the, the selling it as a support with services package, essentially selling it as a product. Um, and it's kind of funny to hear that one of the people on the panel actually went from consulting to training to support, because for a lot of companies, at least the ones that I talk to that are doing a support model, it's very hard for them not to be pulled into consulting, which has the downsides that I mentioned earlier, at least you know, perceived downsides. Um, and the other problem is, of course, if you're trying to build an open source business uh, and trying to sell support using the money from that to improve the product, somebody else could simply try to sell support without wasting the money on improving the product and undercutting you. Um, and, well, there are a couple of other questions I'd like to put uh, to the panel. So if you have any thoughts on these things, and if you work in organizations like any of those, please uh, join the circle and let's have a conversation about them. At least Copano, I know you were just in the room, but... Uh <laughs> and I... Um, I really loved, yeah, sorry to put you in again, but I really appreciate it. I'm sure there are more consultants in the room, right? Exactly, I mean, yes. I mean, at a conference like this. <laughs> same chair or can I move? You can move. You can move if you uh, want a uh, fresh chair. Right, cool. Um, yeah, maybe begin with how do you avoid the trap that, you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's always a risk if... Sorry, is this on? Just? No, it is. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's always a risk, but what we did when we built our support offering, we went to great lengths from experience of having run a managed service provider before. I didn't want to get into that business, and that's why I loosely use that term vendor. We do that vendor-style support. So our support desk is effectively full of engineers. I think somebody else made, made the same comment, which means it fits very well with their day job, which is committing stuff upstream and working on features and working on our project roadmap and what have you. Uh, there are other people offering support services around our project, but none of them do it the way we do, which is basically you're, you're logging a ticket and it's a committer dealing with it. So that's yeah. the service we, we offer, and I think that's a really important thing to, to get right if you're going to build a business which is taking customer money to, to de-risk their organization based on your technology, and you're going to invest that in the technology, you have to offer a support model which is going to fit what you want to do there. Uh, going and offering a, a more tiered support model, I think, leaves an organization uh, a lot more open to that, to that risk. And that's actually what some of our competitors do, do in that space. 
Uh, but I also think as well, I think there isn't a single answer to any of this. It depends on the project. I mean, we're quite lucky with Apache Cloud Stack because it's been around for nine years and it's in the, the plateau of productivity. Nobody pays a lot of attention to it, which we, we've hated for the last nine years. But actually, commercially, it's been great for the last few years for us yeah. because it's not like every, you take OpenStack as an alternative, every vendor under the sun, everybody wanted to build an OpenStack services business five years ago. Nobody was watching Apache Cloud Stack. Uh, yeah. And from a business perspective, ultimately, that's a good thing because we don't have all of those, those vendors. But, you know, it depends on the project. I think there isn't a single answer. Um, we work for quite a few uh, companies that are traditionally al already open source, like Elastic, but we we're also working for some companies that are uh, trying to adopt open source, which would, what we really like to stress f uh, with a lot of those companies or with those new companies that, is that they're experts in the field. And that for them is sometimes still a difficult concept, you know, than, uh, uh, that they're uh, best at what they do. So also do, uh, seeing... Uh, they're really afraid, you know, of, of uh, getting into open source because then what will happen to my brand, you know, can we really uh, uh, still exist as this, you know, uh, what they formerly were as a proprietary business. And uh, I think one of the challenges, you know, that I really see is that they're kind of waiting until everything's ready. What we are trying to do all the time is push them, you know, c come on, guys, you can do this one step at a time. It's not, I mean, we do have two very different kinds of clients, so uh, some that are really open source are really used to it. And uh, still, you know, for the, for the guys, you know, one of the things that I, that I also think, you know, makes, uh, 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 like from the first question, is what really makes uh, companies go, go towards open source is that everything else is open source. So what else can you do, you know, then, uh, then really start with that. So not as a competitive advantage, but almost as a, well, we have to, otherwise somebody it's else does. They're kind of infected, you know, by at least yeah. the company I work with is in open networking, and then everything around it is, you know, there's so many projects. You see the Linux Foundation really adopting open network, and then they really look, okay, there's no other choice. They kind of have to. go open source, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, so I work for IBM which has a long and sorted history of our relationship with open source, um, early supporters of the Apache Software Foundation, early supporters of Linux, but also longtime sellers and of you know, DB2 and other really proprietary solutions. Um, I was hired on to be an open source evangelist. And my experience, which IBM is such a big company, if anybody's watching, um, it could be <laughs> entirely different, and these are my opinions, not the company's. Um, <laughs> but um, the, go, the, the strategy's been, um, you know, developers at really, really large companies want to start moving to open source. It is just, that's the way the winds are blowing. Um, when you get to the, the higher level, the C-suite, the, the, the older people in the company, the decision makers, they are hesitant to do that. Um, I don't know, I, IBM has a lot of open source projects, um, but usually aren't what we're trying to even sell. What we are selling is we can come in and look, there's a huge name, we're selling you a bunch of proprietary stuff, we'll just work this into the service level agreement and we'll tack on some open source on the side, but if anything ever goes wrong, you can call us because we will throw enough money at it to solve your problem. It doesn't matter what's going on. You, we, you can't break IBM and our service, our contract. We'll, we'll take a loss because we're not going to let that happen. Um, so that's, yeah, it's, it's a different, I think, angle from some of the smaller startups. Um, but it's just a unique perspective I kind of wanted to toss in that it's, it's, uh, it's, I know it's a different tack, but yeah. Um, to add to that, um, I mean, um, the history of Copano roots back uh, with Serafa. And uh, I have to admit that we also occasionally take a, a loss based on doing the support. And I think um, if, if, you, if you compare especially the smaller products uh, with, or the smaller projects with the larger projects or larger companies, then you will realize that uh, that is one of the differentiators why people actually choose the smaller ones is, is that the support, generally speaking, is running really well. 
because um, and that's actually the value that you sell. It's not just okay, we can help you, but it's also the type of speed, the type of the type of help, right? So you have. Uh, a lot of commercial vendors which say, yeah, you have phone support but, or email support, but not phone support. And then there are others, uh, that's an extra, right? And um, in, in general, um, I think it's, it's not a bad thing at all to sort of, let's call it commoditize an open source product. That's actually what we do. We have a product. And this product is basically like sold. We don't sell the software as it is, obviously, but because we're talking open source here. But um, people don't want to buy a product which just, it's like when you get a car, right? You, you just take the car, you're off the lot, and then it's your deal. And what we do is, is actually we, we, we give you service. We, whenever you break down, we help you. And that, that's the whole idea behind of it. And um, you have to be good at it, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't come back and say, hey, I like this vendor, I like this, and, and that's it. So that's, that's the big, how, how can you protect it, on the other hand? Well, own cloud and xCloud, uh, to be honest, was not really the best uh, from an outer objective perspective, what happened, because that's the power of forking. Right, yep. um, but on the other hand, uh, if you know the backgrounds of this whole development, uh, then it was a very good decision. Uh, even though um, it it's it generated a lot of air, let's call it that way. But yeah. Yeah. well, I think for for business, of course, one of the advantages of open source that was mentioned is yeah. that it makes sure that the product is around and you're not locked in. Of course, what happened with OwnCloud going bankrupt, uh, yeah, OwnCloud Inc. showed that didn't matter. There were even two companies after, you know, OwnCloud Inc. went uh, bust. So, um, yeah, I would indeed think that it's a good thing. Uh, but of course, from an investment perspective, it was perhaps a bit scary. Well, yeah. I wanted to also say on your slide, part of the way that you get people to renew the, the contracts is by continuing to innovate, right? If it's hard for other people to come in, because as you introduce new concepts and new uh, features into the software, then they are always a step behind, right? So third parties can't come in and support your stuff as well as the people who did the work. And they're always in catch-up mode, and that really hurts them, actually. Yeah. And so it gives you a huge competitive advantage to, to be the ones innovating the, the core of the product. We need someone to fill one of these chairs at least. Somebody have any questions maybe for someone on the panel or wants to bring something else up? Otherwise, please, can, please yeah, come. Just come to the front. Even for one question, please, Even please for come. for a question, just <laughs> sit for a minute. <laughs> Sitting is killing us all. You just extended your life by a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> right, just sit for a minute and ask the question. Hello. I was just interested if um, uh, the open source project or code that you're using to make business out of it that somehow they decided to go in a direction that you see that's contradicting or will hurt you business-wise. How, how you, if any of you had this uh, situation, and how did you tackle it? So if you have a conflict between the community and the direction yeah. the community wants to go and the company, I think that's a really good yeah. question. Yeah. And I'm Thank sure you. there are people here who have answers. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, yeah. um, in, in, in short words, every day. Um, the, the thing how we tackle it, uh, and again, we're doing this for over 10 years now, is prioritizing. Um, please don't get the impression, uh, if there's a customer, it automatically has higher priority than a, a community member. That doesn't work that way. The prioritization goes by the fact is, is how impactful is this for, the, for all users, right? So uh, some of the, the things that came along from the community um, are really also hurting uh, customers. So it was important to us to say, hey, this, this needs to get in. And so the prioritization is based more on the issue or on a bug or on the feature, whatever, um, and has nothing to do at all with uh, community versus company. The only level that you have as a company, which, um, well, you have two levels. One thing is, is that obviously um, the more important, but that's a natural business thing, more important uh, a customer is, um, the more you're inclined to provide essentially a little bit more resources to it, right? So that you say, hey, um, guys, we're talking here, 
a million dollar customer, we really need to make sure that he is happy, right? Um, that's one side of it. But the other side of it is also, and that's the, the great part about open source, um, I mean, you, as you mentioned, you want to innovate the product because only when you innovate the product, you get people to renew. Um, they want to see that the product is moving on. You want to see that the support is going on. And if that all is good, then they will renew and everyone is happy. But um, there are also customers which come in and say like, I need this button in blue. And you have your product in green. And it says like, this looks stupid. We won't do this. I mean. Then he says, well, you know what? We pay X, X, Y, Z for it. And then you say like, okay, you know what? We can do it just for you in your environment. And this is done by a completely separate team, right? So they, they, this is like professional services and, and so on. And they'll do it for you. And, um, but don't expect us to merge this back into the core product. Because if we do so, um, every other customer would say, we're nuts, right? So that's, that's, the, that's the core thing of it. And actually, this is something that is really, let's call it the VIP service for special customers. But it's really completely aside from the development. If you mix that up, you end up being a consulting company and developing your product into being a customer-driven thing. And that's absolutely not what, no, we, we partially have been there long years ago. It's not a good idea. Don't do it. <laughs> well, as always with software, you need to listen to what your customers actually need, not what they say they want, and <laughs> give them something that fits with the, yes. the architecture. <clears throat> so absolutely, your customers are critical for assigning your own resources. But with open source projects, especially the ones that you don't dominate, you're going to get other stuff coming in. So of course, the community provides other stuff, which is a good thing, and your customers will take that and use it. So you, the challenge there is that you need to make the managers understand, yes, you need to rebase and spend engineering effort to get some of those new features coming in. You can't stay on a, a fork from two years ago, right? And um, so that's always a struggle, but you have to, to pay that cost and convince the managers who aren't in open source, right? They're, they're just managing the company priorities, uh, that it's a critical part of what they do. And um, so IBM, who, again, may or may not have a great perceptions in the community, um, all of the committers and PMCs on strategic projects have their own little dev unit that no one can touch. It's an office in San Francisco, and that is to prevent anyone from having any um, being uh, not persuaded, um, incentivized, or having the idea to even try. They have their own management chain, and no one can touch them. And that, and they just because we do want to con contribute to the community, but we want to have that isolation, that firewall. Um, that's how we prevent uh, anyone from calling in who's a big customer yeah, it's a and changing them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But and this we is want a this, pretty we aggressive want this, way yeah, of doing green. it. green. Yeah. Um, so that's. It's another, I guess, just tactic for keeping that division of, yeah. I think they call it the division of church and state, which <laughs> I don't know. Does, does anyone here have experience how this is in an open core company? So if you have an open source product with proprietary add-ons, because then you can see community members who want to develop features that are proprietary add-ons and therefore undercut your company model. I've, I've seen this in the past. We're completely open, so we don't face that part, mm -hmm. but we've dealt with projects where they're dominated by a company that is open core, and yeah, it really sucks, because when you try to put that feature in, they will push back, and, oh, of course. and then you need to <laughs> say it. Okay, we'll either do this on our own and, and add a fork, a, do a fork effectively, or a, a fork of their addition, um, but it basically sucks. <laughs> Um, Holden, uh, who is also running around here, we were talking about this a couple years ago at an Apache Con, and her solution was it was something with, I don't know, it was some sort of streaming thing we, I was working on, and she said, well, then just make Crazy Bob's House of Streaming and just keep going on that, and eventually they'll try to merge you back in and they'll take your stuff. Um, but yeah. <laughs> Dude, the reality which uh, we could face with, oh, we've been open core before, 
um, the thing is, it hurts the product. It, hurt, it hurts the open source part. Um, so for us, uh, we had the luck that MAPI is not uh, an intrusive technology, so you really need time to get into it. But um, therefore, basically locking out others from easily forking, let's call it that way. Um, but the, the reality is, is um, when you have this open core model, then uh, from a natural business perspective, you try to, you know, to, to rub the jewels, right? You, you want to make them nicer and shinier and just add some more jewels to it, mm -hmm. but the crown under it is, is just rusting. And that's exactly the problem what happens when you go open core. I might uh, add something from a different perspective. We have actually given up um, producing our own products by now. So we're basically, I'm working for KDAB. So we're providing consultancy, historically, mainly on Qt or Qt. Um, so this is where we're basically taking the other perspective. So we have the question, how don't we cannibalize the, the, the Qt business model? Because obviously we, uh, our, our services rely on them. And, and this, this relationship between our company providing the, the consulting, we're also uh, the second largest uh, sort of external committer to the project. So, I mean, this is the typical question our, our customers have, like we're running into this very serious problem here. We can't solve it ourselves, so please go ahead and, and, and do it. And um, yeah, this, this, this kind of relation from the other perspective, we, we do want a healthy QT, yeah, because this is uh, yeah. what we sort of live from. But uh, this is this is also from the other perspective. It's not it's not easy. Yeah, we've we've tried a lot of things, but it, it it's it's like we we try to sell uh, licenses for them because we do have customers, so we try to get our share on that. But that sort of start cute to fear about their business model. On the other hand, they are starting you know, to provide services on, on, on consulting because obviously they want to grow, which on the other hand, on our side will say, oh, well, if they are now starting you know, consulting, then what about our business model? So this is, this is uh, I don't have a solution to it. It's an ongoing struggle all of the years. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, it's really a, a vital question how to, how to have this lively and healthy this relationship. Yeah, to have a relationship where multiple companies can actually contribute. I mean, something like OpenStack, of course, have managed to do that. I mean, it's possible, but it's different. Well, well the Qt community manages as well. I, I'm just saying this is, it is hard work from both sides all of the time. I mean, there are other competitors on the market who also contribute to Qt, and they are basically in the same situation as we are. Yeah. All right, maybe it's time for the next question, unless uh, someone else wants to bring something in. If not, then we move on uh, to the next point. Let's refresh the panel, and uh, everyone is, of course, uh, welcome to join again. Um, yeah. Okay, so a uh, bit of a change of theme with funding and raising venture capital funding or from other private investors. Um, in order to get, uh, you know, uh, what do they call it, uh, hyper growth, in, in order to compete with other startups in, in a particular sector, funding is often a critical ingredient. And uh, we had an intense debate, some of the people in this room last night, around the, the pros and cons and the challenges that open source firms face. But um, uh, it seems to me it's much harder for open source firms to, to raise venture capital uh, like for like. Uh, I'm thinking about early stage uh, firms at this point, but I'd really love to hear experience from anybody who's actually tried pitching an open source business uh, or business model, whether the product, uh, whatever stage the product was at, um, and, and how that went, what kind of reactions you, you got. Um, so let's first of all sh have a show of hands. Anybody successfully raised uh, funds for their open source business? One, two, three. I know Horton Works did. Okay. <laughs> nah. Okay. <laughs> so, so okay, rather the question is, has anybody any experience or seen semi-close how to do it? <laughs> yeah. Is that well, can I ask you to join the panel at, at the back? Thank you. And. Uh, uh, yep, yeah. please. Yeah. And by the way, if you've tried, but it didn't work out, yeah. it's a still Anybody going try and, and not succeed yet or at all? 
So everybody who tried to raise funding for open source succeeded, or maybe people are just too shy to, to admit. Okay, good, good. Thank you for being brave enough to, <laughs> to talk about the, the, the unsuccessful ones too. Can I give some, some microphones around? I've actually been uh, only involved at sort of this arm's length. I haven't been in front of any uh, VCs, uh, both with a successful and an unsuccessful uh, project. Um, in the case of the successful project, it was because uh, it, it was based on a humanitarian free open source project that the investor had been uh, supporting up to that point, and it was a pitch to the, in to the investor to say, we would like to make this self-sustaining, um, by building a business on it, um, so it was. A Who is the investor? What, what kind rather, of investor I'd were they? I'd rather just not say it at this point. Okay, um, okay. I'm not sure. But but are they a uh, are they a typical type of VC? Do they specialize in humanitarian no, products? Just a very rich person. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Our favorite. <laughs> um, so they were supporting the project for the, f for that philanthropic reasons. Yes, or? exactly. Okay. So originally he was supp supporting the project. Uh, because he believes in it, and he still supports the project because he believes in it. Um, but he's not going to live forever, and he knows that, and he would like the project to continue. Mm -hmm. And so he was looking for ways to make that happen, and one suggestion was to make a company for profit based on this uh, humanitarian mission, so a social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. um, and he has uh, invested quite a bit, actually, in, in the company based on that mission. Um, the next project that I worked on that didn't succeed, um, just like <laughs> you talk to a lot of people and you don't get money and they're not very open about why. Um, so I mean you get like, it's a great idea. And I'm like, well then. <laughs> do, you, do you feel or suspect that open source played a particular role in that decision? It, it could be, um, I don't like, there's Fair a lot enough. of possibilities. Um, and if it's open source, then it's hard to uh, to say how you differentiate yourself from from existing or future uh, potential competitors on the market. Um, people like VCs want to earn a lot of money. That's kind of what they're in it for. And if there's a low profit margin or a low potential profit margin because somebody else is going to get in on it and compete right away, then they just don't get in. Would you share your experiences? I've had several experiences, and if I can sum up, um, in running an open source business, if you want to pitch VCs, um, you can only get money if you don't actually need it, really. So they would give you the money for growth, but if you actually need money to actually launch your company, you will not find them. Um, there's another thing I had in mind, which is uh, VCs actually, they invest money to resell the shares. So they want to create an asset, literally. They want to create something that they own, and uh, they don't really like the idea that they don't own on that open source software. It's not owned. It's something you share. It's not something you own. It's not a property you own. And, um, May I ask if this is particular yeah. feedback you've, you've received? Like, are these comments that y oh, yeah, y yeah. you've... Yeah. yeah, specific feedback and experience and uh, time and money. So and we're energy, not going to invest... Energy lost in trying to, to <laughs> do that. I've had, uh, and you felt... It, and, and so if, if the same model, the same pitch that you'd been making was for... The same product, but with a proprietary license, you feel it's, the outcome yeah, would have been different. I would different. say it's, it's several things. It, it re, I, I would say it also depends on um, what VC community you're talking about. Um, I have a specific experience with the French environment. Mm -hmm. And there you have people that behave more like bankers or uh, uh, fund managers, and they don't want to risk any money. I mean, the VCs with no risk. The riskless VCs. So it's it's not uh, a, an oxymoron. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I'm a bit harsh on this. but. Uh, uh, it's a long time and energy spent there. Uh, I would say that uh, you you do have, say, you know, on the West Coast, North, North America, VCs that have more a vision and are more likely to gamble on uh, on a. Uh, so so you have those who want to gamble, those who don't want to gamble. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that, but what I want to say about assets and property is uh, something else I realized from from the VC community where they meet the uh, academic community somewhere because in universities or research industry uh, institutes they also want to um, create assets, IP assets that they want to sell and you have the same kind of reaction where people want to have these kind of IP assets that they want to be able to resell to monetize at some point and when you pitch them with an open source business model, it's not that what you sell. You don't sell the asset. You sell customer ownership, you sell your customer base, and that's where the value is really. Just to finish that point, can I, can I ask where, what happened in the end of, of, of this story? So after you had these experiences? No, I've had, I've had several experiences and some, some got money and some didn't get the money. So you did so, successfully yeah. raise funds in some cases for your open yes. source companies. Yes. And was it was it I mean the differences between the failures and the successes was, was something changed in your case? No, no. Or was basically, it, it was the thing is uh, you could raise money if you already have a customer base or flow of orders right. and, uh, and when you don't need it. And as you in said. in the end, the lesson is you get the money if you don't need it. <laughs> and, and can I ask how how you funded getting to the point where you didn't need it? How did you how, I mean, how did you get to the point of being cash flow positive or having a community well, that was large enough to demonstrate no, the value? Time spending and having and signing a few customers and uh, building up a credible customer base and prospect a credible prospect at least. Okay, thank you. Um, perhaps you'd like to share your experience. Yes, I've, I've raised money for a number of businesses at different stages of those businesses, and I, I agree 100%. Going and getting seed money initially, hey, here's my business plan, I'm going to make you lots of money, is nigh impossible. Uh, I think it's a, it's a red herring... Specifically for open source projects? No, no, I'm just say, for, it's a red herring. That open source, not open source, doesn't really matter. Uh, it's... Well, <laughs> In, 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 my, in, my, in my experience, is have you got a good business plan? Do they trust you to deliver that business plan? Have you got any credibility in previously delivering that spreadsheet? And the fact you don't own the IP outright or you don't have the same degree of control in an open source case doesn't make a difference in your experience? I, you know, what it depends what the business model is around open source. Uh, so going to, to raise money with you know, I'm planning to build a support business around a Apache project is a completely different thing to, I'm going to build a, a, a new engine which is going to sit underneath Kubernetes. You know, they're, they're, they're two completely... Uh, and which of those have you tried? The support <laughs> model? Both. Ah. Uh, no, so actually, my current company, Shape Blue, we, I was in a very fortunate uh, position that I was effectively the, the, the seed capital because I'd just exited a, a, a previous business and we've, we haven't had to do any further funding rounds. But I've been on the advisory board of a number of companies where we've had to go and, and get them some initial funding, some angel funding. And a lot of that comes down to trying to find somebody who understands the space, somebody who is probably working in that space, who's just sold their own startup, that, that sort of thing. But, you know, trying to go institutionally and ask for seek if you're not known if you haven't proven that you can do this a few times around uh, one, once you have a, a, a running business it doesn't necessarily have to be cash flow positive but once you're in the situation that uh, you know you have traction for your product you are demonstrating your business plan is moving in the right direction that becomes a whole uh, easier conversation and most from experience most of the institutional investors, certainly in, in London where I am, uh, a lot of them are closely related to Silicon Valley companies, a lot of them are Silicon Valley companies with, with, with the London offices, uh, they completely get this. You want okay? that they, un they understand open source, they understand the technology, they have you know, people in residence who have come out of a lot of these projects. So certainly don't be scared by that. They if understand it and they embrace the concept to some com extent. Completely, completely. I, 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 Maintain, I don't know if red herring is a very, just an English term, is it? But it's, it's a, no, no, yeah, it's a, I think it's a misconception. To, it's <laughs> overplaying it too much to say open source is the big thing here. That's almost on page five of the business plan. Uh, I bet no. He disagrees. He disagrees. <laughs> no, actually, Sorry. okay. Just go, go, go. go, well, go, go. No, you go first. But, go uh, so Hornworks, of course, we had the huge advantage that Rob Bearden was at Venture at a venture capital firm, right? He was at Benchmark, and so he knew what he wanted in an open source company, and that was a huge leg up. The other advantage that it comes from saying you're going to do an open source company, especially for a project that's already successfully meeting customers' needs, is that you've already distributed 
demonstrated that that community is there, right? You're solving real problems with real code. And so if you can take that and say, okay, we're going to leverage that community, you're a huge step up on someone who just has a slide deck, right? And that, that's actually a huge, huge point. I, I totally agree. So, so this is well, a huge advantage, so just, just to it's clarify. It's a huge advantage for open source companies is that you've already demonstrated that you've got a usable product that's helping people solve real problems. Okay. Thanks. Um, from, from the point, um, I, I, have to, I have to intervene with, with the open source part, uh, that there is no differentiator. The problem for, um, and just a little background, I've personally not made any direct VC deal, but I assisted in many, um, and um, let's call it this way, I know many wealthy people that can help in that area. So the thing is, is, is the, the thinking of a VC is that he wants to have the highest possible gain at the lowest possible risk. So the lowest possible risk nowadays is not that, that important anymore, which is good for open source actually. But um, because we've got more risk to deal with, is that the, the implication? The problem is it's just the general market at the moment. The interest rates are everywhere down, so basically investors try to find places where to put their money in. And uh, the problem is, is, is uh, you know, when you, when you have, it's, it's like on a stock market. If you have something where you know, hey, this is secure, your interest rate is low, but if you want to take chance, your possibilities are endless. So the, th the thing is, is with open source, um, there, there are certain VCs in the world which understand open source, right? Uh, Andy Bechtosheim is a, is a perfect example of that, right? Uh, he really knows what he's talking about. He really knows open source. He knows the mentality and he knows the benefits of it because the, oh, just that you're doing open source doesn't mean that you cannot materialize a business out of it. Red Hat and others are, are perfect examples for that. But the major problem is, is um, that when you, and that's, that ties in with your point, when you want to uh, when when you want to run a business that has the core of open source, you need proof. You need proof of it, and that is only something that you can do by community, so by customers. Proof of what anything. specifically? Proof of that the product works. That that the not code, proof of a business model. No, the proof of business model cannot be proven in any way. I mean, that's the idea of a business plan, right? It it gives you a path, and you can think like, ah, that sounds like a good bet, or not. But um, the, the only proof that you can have, and that's where, where open source really, where really has a big advantage actually is, is this that you can prove and say like, hey, I have this user base. I have like 500 developers in the back. They know what they're doing. They ha also the team part is also a big aspect. 500 community developers, you mean? Yes, 500 community developers or thousands of installations uh, running in production. This is important stuff because they know, hey, I can monetize that because I know you know I as a VC then have the option to say hey this is something I want to a monetize B I can develop C I know it's really a need so I see the target group which I can approach and grow but they will never own the IPO in the same sorry yeah, the, the IP in the, in the but, same way that the others would but and that's the big thing here when you have an open source product that does not mean that you automatically have the, the, the knowledge to maintain it. Obviously, in OwnCloud, NextCloud, this thing was very special because a lot of people from the OwnCloud team forked basically their own project. And this is, a, this is obviously a, logist, a logical uh, fear from, from a VC. But the reality is, is the larger the community is, the, the harder it actually is executed. Uh, I don't want to name any projects here, but there are even in the office area, good examples of how a fork can also not run too well, let's call it that way. Um, <laughs> there, are all, there are also uh, areas where um, look in a security area and in an encryption area. Um, the thing is, is you need traction, you need base, and when you get that, then you at least have higher chances. It's a shame Florian uh, departed. I think he'd have something to say <laughs> about that. Sorry, but no. Can we just take the last uh, two yeah, inputs here? Ju 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 just to add to that, I'm in 100% agreement with you there. My point around it doesn't really matter is open source is we framed this from the context of looking for problems with <coughs> open source and okay. raising money. I'm saying it is not a problem. It's only a positive. Uh, and it's only a positive in terms of, you know, we talk about minimum, uh, minimum viable product, etc. Normally, when you're raising money around open source, you're already there. You mm. have the community. You have 
customers, even if they aren't paying customers, right? They're people who are using the software. And, and yet, when we look at the number of companies which are uh, so, you know, providing only open source solutions, which are valued at a billion dollars or more, or who have received a hundred million dollars in venture capital investment or more, it's uh, we're talking about you know, ten, ten fingers, more, more, you know, like it's it's with tiny, tiny numbers. I think um, there's some big global economic questions. From, <laughs> you know. Fair enough. Can we take the, la the last point from no, you? And I think no, one thing very important is that the basics of VC funding still apply to any open source businesses, which is the team, and they really invest in the team. So it's not just about technology. You can have a very bright guy in technologies. I have myself lost a lot of money with four very bright guys who suddenly disappeared and played divas. And uh, the thing is, you need to have people who are committed to building a, a real business. So in the challenges of pitching open source businesses, you really need to have the team and the more experience. And now we have people uh, people pitching VCs who've been through several uh, generations of several companies, like, uh, for instance, in your case, you've been through, so you have the experience, and that's uh, a lot of credibility. Now, the, the other thing is you need to have the whole, uh, um, the, what you've mentioned already, covered already, but productization is, and uh, scale, uh, business model that scales, because you can have a very bright te technology uh, team. Uh, that can develop something, but it's all about, they say, execution. So it's all the basics. All the basics, the one-on-one -on -one of VC funding totally applies to open source with maybe a little pitch of uh, uh, difficulty, but also of interest because you have to figure out that open source is much more in the mainstream, has got so much more in the mainstream over the last five, six years. I mean, with the open source, I could do and, and all that. And probably with AI, there's a new wave of things coming up. All right. Thank you. I guess that is uh, all the note on which we end. Uh, I found interesting your point that maybe there aren't just enough people who have done it before, there's not enough experience. That's at least one way of uh, taking that. Um, we just have to keep trying as a community and uh, suddenly there will be more Red Hats someday. <laughs> um, so we're at the end of our time. I mean, people for the next talk, I think, are already coming in. Um, it would be really great if you could all help quickly to put the chairs back because, you know, we made a bit of a mess. And thank you for your participation. And thank you all right? for participating. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thanks.